to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And on today's show, we're doing something a little bit different. This season, we've covered traditional personal finance topics such as investing, equity compensation, estate planning, alternative assets, taxes, 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 and more taxes, Mm. as well as some non-financial topics such as career development, mindfulness, and entrepreneurship as well. And as you can imagine, we receive quite a few emails from listeners following each episode, and sometimes they include some very thoughtful and insightful questions. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. My producer, Eric, has pulled out some of his favorite listener questions from season one. Some of them I'm aware of and some of them I haven't seen yet. Uh, But he did promise me that they won't all be technical questions like what is a Roth IRA? And instead, he's bringing me some of the more fun stuff. So this should be interesting. But before we get started, I just want to make sure that you guys know season one is coming to an end. It's not over yet. We still have a few really great, really fun episodes scheduled for you. But just know that uh, season one ends in November and you won't have us uh, back on your podcast feed until sometime in January. So Eric, I am excited for the the little bit of time off there. I don't know about you, but as we were doing our pre-production meeting earlier today, uh, it occurred to me that we just had three more episodes to go and I felt myself getting a little bit excited. Yeah. I mean, this is it, coming to the close of a season is a pretty big deal. I mean, that, that means you put a lot of content out there. Obviously, that's where a lot of these questions came from, yeah. uh, from the listeners and the, the, the people that are learning all about you and, and getting this education that you're putting forth. Uh, but there's always a question lingering, right? So that's, that's, I love the fact that you put this podcast together. Well, I tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let's do it. All right. So question number one. Yes, sir. Are there any ways that you recommend to teach kids about money? So uh, I think the first thing to avoid is that trap as a parent of assuming that kids can't grasp Mm -hmm. complex concepts. Right. I think kids are often capable of more than we assume they are. As a new parent myself, I've become very aware uh, of that fact, too. Uh, And also, you know, trying too hard to make it too fun. Like, yes, we need to make it interesting and easier for them to grasp than if we were talking to other adults, you know, at work or Mm -hmm. at a party or something. But not so much that it waters it down. Right. And I also think it's really important to anchor the lesson you want to teach the kids in some sort of real world scenario they're used to. Right. So if you want them to learn about compound interest, for an example, right, that's a popular one. Talk to them about how a snowball grows bigger and bigger as it rolls down a hill. Or Mm -hmm. if you want them to learn how venture capital works, something more technical, right. Talk to them about their school bake sale or how some other fundraiser they helped with and and how everybody collectively worked together to drum up the money to bring their goal to fruition. Right. Mm. Those are the kinds of things that kids Mm. experience on a daily basis, that if you relate the thing you want to teach them to what they already know, they'll get it much faster and be off to the races. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to chime in here because as an old parent, you're the new parent, I'm the old parent. (laughs) Kids are always listening. Kids are yeah, always listening yeah. and they're absorbing. They're mini sponges. We know that. Um, so I would just say the other thing is not just about teaching. Just be cautious about how you talk about money with your spouse or your significant other. Um, if you guys are stressing about money or if you're, if you haven't forbid you're arguing, which does happen, uh, believe me, it's happened. Uh, yeah. But the kids pick up on that. And if you're stressed about money, they learn that money is stressful. And so trying huh. to have those neutral conversations uh, at, at good times encourages them to understand money is a tool not something that is, you know, a love hate relationship. It can be, it can be very fruitful. All right. I just, is it advice from the old guy? <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Do you recommend any tools or publications to help stay up on all the various things happening in the finance world? That's a good one. Um, I like that. Besides podcasts, uh, <laughs> besides this podcast, uh, right? I mean, but seriously, though, I'm a really big consumer of podcasts. I must listen to like 20 or 25 different shows on a weekly basis. Mm. And, you know, some of them are about personal finance. Some of them are politics, entrepreneurship. So that's one way I, I like to look for conversations with people I wish I could call up and have a conversation with personally. Right. So podcasts mm-hmm. allow me to I don't know, talk to Barack Obama, for example, vicariously. And mm-hmm. that's something you can't get anywhere else. Um, 
Another thing I think is important to do is have friends who are an expert in their craft, who you can draft off of, right? Their knowledge and success already exists and you can learn from them. And an example of that, I guess, is this very podcast. Like as I'm talking about it, I have friends and contacts who are experts in their particular domain. I bring them to the audience here. And rather than going and reading all of the books they've read and taking all of the schooling they've had, I call up somebody I know, have an intentional conversation about something I want to learn quickly. And I just trust that they should know what they're talking about, because this is the thing they've been, you know, spending all this time uh, learning. And then I also read a lot on my own. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, probably each week I'm reading, I don't know, 10 different publications, at least like 30 minutes each morning and an hour or so in the morning on, on weekends. And, you know. This may actually be the question they were asking. So I'll I'll list a few actual outlets, right, that I read. So I read Bloomberg.com a couple of times a week, The Wall Street Journal, of course, Barron's every Saturday, Business Insider, Market Watch sometimes. There's plenty. But like those are some of the ones I've found Mm -hmm. uh, have experts that are providing the analysis and not only like journalists or opinion columns. And then as for tools, I really like uh, Investopedia, which I know you're a fan of as well. Um, I've yet to hear... Uh, or see any financial concept out there in the ether somewhere that I don't know. And then when I went to Investopedia site to look it up, there wasn't something there already explaining mm-hmm. in depth what that thing was and how it works. So I really like them as a resource as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. This, I, I, this is a very interesting question. Um, this listener is, is uh, putting you putting the tax to you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> okay. You talk a lot about investing on this podcast and in your writing sure. and everything else. But you never talk about, or at least I've never heard you talk about how you invest your own money and what you invest in, right? So do you actually follow your own advice? And then, you know, it's, do you practice what you preach? I guess is another way to say that. Ooh, that's a, that's a heat. (laughs) Um, so I hope my answer is equally as compelling because that was, uh, that's a very thoughtful question. Mm -hmm. Um, so the answer is yes and no, uh, I'll explain the yes answer first because it's, it's easier, but. Uh, then I'll explain the no answer. Mm -hmm. So in my retirement account, in my 401k, I'm invested right alongside, right alongside our clients, right? So clients Mm -hmm. of the firm, the portfolios that they're in, I'm in one of those same, the, the exact same funds and ETFs there. And I don't trade in and out of stuff to beat the market. I rebalance once per quarter and no more. And I'm diversified among various asset classes, right? Simple and boring is how I like it when it comes to saving for retirement. Get rich slow is the way I I always promote it to people. As for my other investments, a couple of caveats here, right? We keep a good bit of cash reserves for the business. Mm -hmm. My wife and I also have quite a few months of expenses covered in cash as our emergency savings. Mm -hmm. And I also recognize that I have a pretty healthy risk appetite, right? Probably above average. But as I just laid out, I also have the capacity to take on the risk as well. If anything I'm invested in were to evaporate into the air tomorrow and go to zero, it's not going to affect my ability to pay the mortgage or my car loan or buy my kid diapers, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not risking any money I need tomorrow. uh, And I always have a a bit of a longer time horizon because I'm probably never going to actually retire. We're not moving or buying a new house anytime soon. My kid Mm -hmm. isn't going off to college anytime soon and so on. So caveats all out there. Do with that what you will. Um, But that's so that said, I I do own a handful of individual stocks, Um, mostly things I think are going to fundamentally change the way that we do something over the next five years or so, Mm -hmm. Um, like electric vehicles is an example or telehealth, I think, is here to stay or blockchain technology, those kind of things. I think, you know, they're not super long term like space travel, but they're long enough term that they're going to take a while to, you know, come to fruition and. We'll see what happens. And and I like tracking and following those companies. And then I'm also in some small privately held companies as well. Right. And since that involves even more risk, I only like to invest in things I have a working expertise in. So for now, at least uh, as an example, I have several investment licenses and a few different insurance insurance licenses and a mortgage originators license. And I spent two Two, I spent several years working for for two of the four largest banks in the world. Right. So everything I'm in and looking at falls into the realm of fintech because that's what that's the world I really know. So whether it's insurance tech, mortgage tech, payments tech, you know, buy now, pay later, all those good things. I stay in my own swim lane where I can, because at least I can mitigate the level of risk involved with like my knowledge set, which is actually one of my rules of thumb for investing, which is only invest in things you truly understand. So 
I'm fascinated by the worlds of like AI and AR, uh, machine learning, quantum computing, things like that. But I'm nowhere near knowledgeable enough about any of them to feel comfortable risking any real money to invest in startups doing that sort of work. So just as an example, I avoid stuff like that and just stick to the the rivers and the lakes that I'm used to as the as the song goes. As the song goes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So short story long. uh, Yes and no is, (laughs) is my answer there. There you go. And if you didn't like that answer and you are the one that wrote that question in, write in again. <laughs> Be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm would encourage it. All right. Um, here's another one. Mm-hmm. How do I know the best way to take advantage of today's housing market? Should I sell and invest or is there a better option? Um, I, I assume by sell and invest, they're talking about sell the property they currently own to invest in the housing market, maybe. I would, I would um, assume something similar. Yeah. I don't know. And I know that's not a great answer, but the reason I say that is because I'm seeing a lot of private equity, venture capital, hedge fund money going into single family home ownership now Mm -hmm. um, because there's so much cash out there that folks are, are, are running out of opportunities, basically. And so now they're not even investing solely in commercial real estate the way they were pre pandemic. They're investing in uh, residential properties the way they did in 2009, 2010, coming out of the financial crisis when we had all those foreclosures. And so one of the things that I've been paying attention to, and this may actually answer the question in some roundabout way, is there's there's apps now. uh, Ground floor is one of the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. I can't remember all of them, but there's like five that I've seen and been paying attention to where they'll even allow you to invest in flips. So you've got people out there mm. who are flipping houses and, and um, making great money doing it, just like they did in 09, 2010, 2011, following, again, the, the mortgage foreclosure crisis. And this allows you sort of to be the bank. What that means then is there's more cash available to folks who are out there flipping those houses. Individual investors have more cash in their pocket. More people are interested in investing these days. And so I think using something like that to invest indirectly, spread your money out a little bit more than uh, investing in one specific property and one specific market that needs a specific buyer, as an example, right? If I if I was to buy a property, a rental property next to a hospital, and then that hospital goes bankrupt in two years because COVID completely wiped them out. Well, now my investment is probably not worth a ton anymore because doctors and all the other highly paid folks who work at that hospital aren't there to be mm-hmm. able to pay rent. You get where I'm going. That linkage oh, yeah. disappears. But by using some of these platforms that spread your investment out, it allows you to invest in real estate without taking on the risk of, of getting wiped out because one property didn't go the way you, you thought it would. All right. Next question. Are there any books about money that you recommend for people who are not financial professionals that can help them get better with money? So let me just first say I always love this question because the answer is always changing because people are always recommending new books to me. So I'm Mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. reading new books and thus I have new books to recommend to to the people asking the question, especially now that I've accepted audio books and stopped feeling like I was cheating. Um, So my new favorite is The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Um, It's a great book that talks about like all kinds of money centric topics. However, one of my favorite parts of the book is at the end where he details like the history of our financial system in the U S and how we came to rely on credit so much and save so little. That's always fascinating to me because America used to be a savers economy and then it became a spenders economy. Another one is called, uh, your money or your life. And it's by a lady named Vicky something, Vicky Robin. Maybe this book is actually credited with sparking the obsession with the fire movement. Um, One of my favorite overarching concepts in that book is about figuring out your enough point and sticking with it. So how much house is enough house, how much car is enough car, how much luxury handbags or Rolex watches or whatever you actually need to feel good about yourself and your accomplishments and then allowing yourself to stop chasing. Because many of us, if we're not careful, get caught up in the trap of constantly chasing more and more. And so we become a slave to our possessions and forget to actually live and enjoy life. And so I really like that one. And then uh, lastly, I'll throw in uh, the startup of you, which is by Reed Hoffman, the the founder of LinkedIn and also a notable uh, PayPal alum. And that one is full of tactical ways to go about like setting yourself up for success in your career by 
literally thinking strategically and making moves like the founder of a startup would. So investing in yourself at every level of your career, not just the beginning and how that evolves as you get more advanced, um, how to know when it's time to pivot to something else, because what you're doing isn't working right. Mm -hmm. Finding your personal board of advisors, just like a corporation has all those kind of business concepts. It then brings down and relates to uh, individual people going throughout their their working lives, which is really cool. All right. Next question. We as investors are constantly being told to focus on one thing after another if we want to stay up on the markets and what's happening. Mm-hmm. But it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, that's yeah, an understatement. Uh, <laughs> this. Uh, of all the different things happening in the markets right now, is there anything that you think we really need to be paying attention to? <laughs> yes. How much time we have left. <laughs> I, I wouldn't readily dismiss the conversation around inflation. Okay. I think. That's one that is likely to come up again and again over the next couple of years because our supply chain is like literally broken. It's not like limping along. It's not a bend, don't break. It's it's broken at all different points. Right. We got all kind of container ships stuck in the water and goods stuck in, you know, factories and trucks waiting to be loaded and drivers of those trucks sitting and waiting for their like everything in the supply chain is broken. And so I think inflation is probably going to be a problem that we see uh, for the next 24 months or so at at best. Um, I think it's especially important for retirees who are on a fixed income and need their dollars to go as far as possible every month. Right. When we say inflation as uh, investment professionals, I think the average person may not know exactly why inflation matters. And that's the reason is because, you know, if one hundred dollars bought you X yesterday, uh, and then we fast forward six months and that same hundred dollars can only buy you uh, two thirds of whatever X is, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. at that point. Well, then your hundred dollars doesn't do what it used to do, but you still are getting paid the same hundred dollars, yeah. you know, that, that you were before. And so now you've got a bunch of people who can't afford those goods anymore and have to make a decision between do I eat today or do do I buy my prescription meds, for example, or do I put gas in my car? Do I pay for my kids uh, child care? Like those kind of decisions um, is is the challenge that inflation creates. So something to be on the lookout for, for sure. Um, I'm also a bit concerned by how aggressive Joe Biden and his administration seem to be. Um, relating to tax policy, like the things haven't quite happened the way they initially thought they would because they got so bogged down by fighting among the Democrats and uh, uh, infrastructure. But I'm still concerned about Joe Biden and his his uh, tax policies They're they're, They aren't trying to come at it with a scalpel and make small incremental changes Mm -hmm. here and there. They're looking to make like take a sledgehammer to some longstanding tax policies that we've been using to help Uh, clients make decisions for for years in developing these financial plans and they're willing to overnight just change things without much time to plan and adjust. That's an issue for me. And, you know, regardless of whether you think the changes are fair or unnecessary or wherever you, you know, fall politically, that's not my, you know, stance to take, but the speed with which they're wanting to put the new tax policy in place with like minimal warning and guidance is what bothers me. Um, Mm -hmm. That's not how it usually goes in, in tax world. So that's those are two key things that I see, you know, toward the end of the year that could be significant challenges um, for us in the economy. Well, I, I find this next question kind of, uh, I don't know, I want to say funny, but ironic maybe. I've, I've kind of had this question in the back of my head ever since I started working with you and knowing <laughs> you and knowing what you do. So here it is. You seem to get a lot done. From mm-hmm. the podcast to writing to speaking, your board work and all the other things that you're doing. And then obviously the financial planning work you do for your clients. And mm-hmm. here's the question, and this is the one that's been on my mind. How do you keep it all organized and get everything done? <laughs> First, let me say I'm just glad it appears to be all well organized and on track. <laughs> um, like, like, let me just get that out there. If it looks and feels that way, then mission accomplished. That means yeah, that the people yeah. I have around me like you uh, are helping to make it look like I am some super organized professional person. But yeah, so I mean, it also helps, you know, that things are scheduled and on my calendar well in advance. Right. Mm-hmm. So there aren't too many surprises that knock me off track at this point. And then I hug pretty tightly to that calendar and say no to everything else. So that's part of it. I guess that's two answers, right? Be really good about your calendar and then also don't be afraid to say no. 
I just mentioned that we're taking a break right from doing this podcast. Mm-hmm, it'll mm-hmm. it'll probably be like a, a two month lull, right, where people don't hear this coming into their uh, ears for a while. I will do something else in that two months, right? Mm-hmm. I, I I take the downtime to do other things that even if it it you know doesn't seem like uh, it's happening, it's happening during that time, and then I'll pick it back up and work on it again when I have another lull, maybe in the summer or something like that. So that's that's also part of it. But then I'll, I, more importantly, I work with some really talented people, like I said, who are experts in things that I'm not, um, and I do my best to stay out of their way and. You know, with this podcast, there's five or six people who touch every episode and Mm -hmm. I have no business telling the editing team how to do what they do. Or I have no business telling the design team which shade of blue to use and where. Right. So (laughs) I just show up, contribute my part and then get the heck out of the way. Other thing that I'll say that, you know, it's related and unrelated, I guess, is that I don't place any artificial caps on what I'm able to accomplish. Right. In Mm -hmm. any day or week or year, Um, the same way I was talking about, like, not trying to dumb things down for kids because we don't believe in what their capacity is. I I think we do that also as adults. Like we put limits on ourselves for Mm. what we believe is possible in a daily, uh, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. And then that evolves into even an entire lifetime or career. You know, an example of what I mean is like, if I, if, if you and I were to go to the gym, I'm your personal trainer. And I say, Eric, do 25 push push-ups. no matter how strong you are, Your arms are going to start wobbling around number 23, 22, 24. You may not even finish number 25. But if I said, Eric, do as many push-ups as you can, and we're not going to bother to count. You'd probably do like 30, 35, Mm. 50, who knows? Because there's no artificial cap that's been placed on your ability. That's the same approach I take to life, to business, to everything else. Like, who knows what all I can get done in a 24-hour day or in a year as long as I believe that literally anything is possible. And so probably sounds a little hokey, you know, to say it that way, but that's genuinely what I believe. Like I just do what I do and it turns out and amounts to whatever it comes out to. And I'm usually pretty pleased with the outcome, even though I am pretty tough on myself. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I I do appreciate the fact that you think I can do 30 pushups. All right. So (laughs) let's move on. Next question. Hindsight is 2020. Uh, sure. This is going to be this is going to be interesting. Hindsight is twenty twenty. What is mm-hmm. the one financial decision you've made in your life that you would change if you could? Whoa! All right. Ah, uh, okay. That is <laughs> that's that's uh, really putting me on the spot again. Um, I think uh, so. Anybody who's ever heard me speak at anything related to people younger than myself, so usually like college students, because even though I'm in my thirties, I like to think that college students are the only people younger than me. Mm-hmm. Um, The thing I always caution them to do a really good job of that I didn't do is avoiding credit and credit cards and debt Mm -hmm. early on in their uh, working lives or not even working yet while they're in college. So that was my biggest uh, downfall was that when I was in college, I had the foresight to uh, buy my first house when I was 19, actually, which, you know, long story, I won't get into on this one, but super yeah, big accomplishment. I'll pat myself on the back for that one. But then what did I turn around and do? I showed my age and went out and loaded up the house with furniture and mm. uh, a giant TV on the wall and all kind of stuff and put it all on credit. So the same uh, stuff that I bought in, I, I don't know what the year was. Let's say it was, I don't know. So the same stuff I bought all in one year, I spent like the next five years paying for. Yeah. Um, because of the way interest works and credit card interest rates are astronomical and whatever. Right. So that's the one thing I always give to, to those folks. My credit score is great now, but it took me I spent basically two years not doing any of the fun stuff that my friends were out doing when we graduated from college, working my butt off to pay off all of the credit card debt that I had racked up so that I could get to a place where, you know, I go to apply for a job at a financial services firm. They run my credit as part of the overall job, Mm -hmm. you know, onboarding process. Thankfully, I made that commitment. And by that point, you know, I had already cleaned up all the stuff I had on there and my score was high enough that they were like, "Okay, this dude doesn't seem like a risk. But had I not done that, I wouldn't even be in the field that I'm in now. I would have been like kept out of doing this thing. I came to found out came to find out that I love Mm -hmm. simply because I racked up so much credit that my balances were basically up against their limits 
and brought my score down by like a hundred points. So I say that to say like the one thing, if I had the ability to go back and do it, I would have learned the, the rule that I now preach to other people, which is that just because you can get approved for it does not mean you can actually afford it. All right. That's great. Yeah. This, this, this next question, it's, it's so interesting. You and I were talking before we hit the record button today mm-hmm. and uh, we, my wife and daughter and I went down to Mexico and we were down there last week and my daughter's, like I told you, has done great with finances, done great with her money, works hard. She paid for the trip herself. So proud of herself, better credit score than I have. I mean, she's, yeah, she's I'm really, really good. Uh, I'm going to send my daughter to you guys. And- <laughs> <laughs> You can raise her too. Hey, uh, sir, uh, you, I, I'm sure she's adorable, but you keep that little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Empty nesting is kind of nice. Anyway, yeah. uh, but it seems like this next question is basically coming out of her mouth because we, yeah. she actually did say this down in Mexico, talked about this a little bit. So the question is, it seems like financial advisors only ever want to work with older people who are retired mm-hmm. or have millions of dollars in the bank. Um, but that's not what most of America is like right now. Sure. Uh, what can the rest of us who are younger, and this, this was her question, you know, how do I even work with a financial advisor? I'm, I'm so young. Would they even take me? So the question is, what can the rest of us who are younger and maybe don't have much yet to do? How do they get to work with a professional like yourself? Fair criticism of the industry as a whole. Right. I won't even try and shy away from that one or, mm-hmm. or uh, debate that. That is absolutely true and fair. Uh, I think that one of the things we could do a better job of as an industry is messaging. Right. There's. Certainly firms who cater specifically to younger millennial or even Gen Z clients. And I happen to know a couple of them personally, but I don't think they're as easy to find as they should be. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there probably aren't enough firms catering to this particular demographic. I'll certainly concede that as well. Additionally, I'll say one of the reasons more established firms don't normally cater specifically to younger clients is because fewer, fewer of them can afford the services. Right. Or they Mm -hmm. just aren't willing to pay whatever, what it costs, what it actually costs. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a put down. I just mean that like literally people in their forties, fifties and sixties tend to make more money than those in their twenties and thirties. So if we think logically for a second about who's likely to be able to afford to have a personal financial planner in their life, it's the folks with the higher incomes. Just mm-hmm. like if I, I'll use my gym example again, if I think about who can afford a personal trainer versus who can just afford to get into the gym, it's usually people higher incomes, right? That's who's going to be able to afford uh, an add on service like that. So with that in mind, though, there's there's several services that strike the balance between doing it yourself completely or having a full service advisory firm working on your behalf. And I think a, a hybrid service like that is a great entry point. I know that like I don't know. Vanguard has a service like that. Charles Schwab has one. Fidelity has one. Like there's quite a few to choose from. Like, okay. those companies allow you to call in and chat with a certified financial planner, ask questions and get some level of guidance. But if and when your life becomes a bit more complex and you need a more personal touch, that's when you search for the more full service option and, you know, level up a little bit. But this way you would have gotten started sooner and likely will be on more solid financial footing earlier on um, rather than, you know, waiting until you're in your 40s, 50s and 60s and then seeking out uh, that financial planner. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's great advice. I hope that answered the, the you know. Yeah. I, I hope that answered my daughter the spirit of the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send this podcast to her for sure. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, and I, 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 I love this one. I love the, to, to wrap up with, the, with this one. Malcolm, what comes next? What are you working on that you're excited about? Um, I, so I, I, I'm, I'm happy about this question and I was doing my best not to say too much and tip my hand earlier on to get to this, um, because I knew that this was in the, 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 the group of, of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I am working on a book that I'll be releasing sometime in 2022. I won't even put a date on it. Just in case, give myself some, some wiggle room just in case. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's called the uh, 10 Financial Commandments for High Earning Young Professionals. So very specific. It's probably going to be taking up a good bit of bandwidth. So that answers the question, you know, what happens between now and season two, right? Mm-hmm. That I, I didn't want to jump the gun and, and point out. And also like one of the 
commandments that I'm talking about is that whole thing about just because you can get approved for it doesn't mean you can actually afford it. Um, yeah. Like that's one of the tenants, the key tenants about using credit wisely that I'll have in that book. Um, and so, like, like I said, I, it took a lot for me to just hold that that little nugget back because <laughs> you were going to give me an opportunity. But yeah, that should be showing up in folks uh, uh, Amazon uh, wish list soon enough. Um, and I'm like, really excited about that to the point that I won't even like dampen it by talking about anything else that's less exciting because that's the the really big thing for next year that that will be happening in my world man that's fantastic I'm, I'm excited I'm excited for you I'm excited to, to get a copy of it and and read it and and uh, hear your yeah, voice it's in been it. it's been four years coming like it I've been talking about this and talking about this and scribbling notes down here and there and reading other people's books and saying, this sounds like something I would have said. I should have said it too. <laughs> um, and so, you know, now I don't, I don't have any excuses. Uh, I, I need to just like get rolling. And so we're already uh, underway. Um, my, by we, I mean my editor and I, I'll save the, the, the predictions for exactly when, but I'll just say 2022. All right, Malcolm, that's the end of our questions. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for today? I think I used them all up, man. Those were all good. Uh, <laughs> no, no real softballs in there. That was all like, like calling me to the carpet and, and stuff on like what I have in my portfolio and yeah, uh, that guy and, and why financial advisors don't like young clients. Like those were all things that made me scratch my head a little bit. So no, I'm out of I'm out of other ideas. All right, then we'll wrap this up. Malcolm, always great to be with you. Thank you so much. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. It also makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your colleagues. And we would humbly ask you to leave a review because that will also help other people find the show. You can connect with Malcolm on social media all over the place at Malcolm on Money. We'd love to hear from you. And again, if you'd like to be part of one of these future shows where Malcolm answers a bunch of more questions, you can send your questions in to Malcolm by emailing to podcast at malcolmethridge.com. Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped make you a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmethridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmethridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge, with the production, the editing and sound controls powered by Proudmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.